going, baby? How you living? How you living? I really like to take this challenge for myself, aside of just being a musician. Yeah, she had a swishy jacket and some thing in her head. <laughs> Even it's really, really big for you. Yeah, it's like the size of me. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't say anything stupid. <laughs> I, yes, I hope. It's just like a crazy metal band, like shooting everything up. My advice is forget the movies and look for a good job. No. My my daughter is going to sleep, so I need to <laughs> say goodnight to her. I don't want terrible things to always be happening to me and my children. <laughs> I think I was more nervous when the movie was premiering and coming out because then I realized that people actually had to see it. Nice to escape the studio. We have uh, the beautiful, sunny, not sunny English countryside behind us. <laughs> uh, this country and this world uh, can do a whole lot better. Wow, what a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> right, like I want people to know that you didn't just show up now. That's where the, the idea of the pancake came from. But you're the only person ever who has ever asked me that question, ever. Oh, wow. I'm Mark Sudiyama from Eclectic Arts based here in Seattle, Washington. And thank you so much for joining me on this Wednesday, the 11th of August, 2021. And my guest today is an Emmy and Peabody award-winning journalist and filmmaker. Her new documentary, which you saw the trailer of, is a powerful look at the lives and careers of five pioneering camera women Please welcome to the Eclectic Arts Virtual Studio, Heather O'Neill. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me. So, hi. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. How are you doing today? Sure. I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well. I can feel it getting hot in my home right now. <laughs> so it's just going to get warmer. But it is summer, so I guess I just have to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm so looking forward to talking to you about uh, this documentary because as I mentioned to you pre-show, it was so powerful that it, it stayed with me for a few days after I watched it. And so um, can you kind of bring me back to the timeline of when did you decide to start this particular project? Uh, like when, when was that? And then how long were you filming and, and doing everything to put it all together? Yeah, um, well, I think the genesis of the film started in 2006 when I met um, one of our characters, Mary Rogers in Baghdad. And I had been working at CNN internationally in the field for quite a few years. And I really had never met a camera woman before. And um, Mary kind of jokes in the film, it's like finding a leopard in the jungle. And I was just really struck by her fierceness and, you know, just absolute commitment to journalism, to the story, to working in a dangerous country, undergoing, you know, a terrible conflict. And, you know, about three and a half years ago, I really decided to seriously sit down and think about putting this film together. And um, I talked to the other camera women that are featured in the film and some I had worked with also uh, when I was a journalist at CNN. And, you know, they really had some amazing stories to share. And, you know, eventually we, we just decided like, hey, this, this would make a great documentary. And um, so we started filming with them about three years ago and um, went to Europe. Uh, Mary lives in Cairo, so we went to Cairo to film with her. And um, then basically took, you know, probably almost a whole year to go through all of their footage. They just had hundreds and hundreds of tapes, beta tapes, if anybody remembers those from back in the day. And it was just this gold mine that they had kept all of their stories. And, uh, you know, that's when I knew like the documentary was really going to take shape. Okay. Wow. I, um, I, I can only imagine, um, all the work it took to go through all of the tapes that they had, which is obviously great, like you mentioned, but at the same time, it's like, it must be a little bit daunting at the same time. Like, man, there's so much footage to go through. We, we better get to it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had a great co-producer, Rich Brooks, and, you know, we literally got a beta deck off, um, you know, eBay and uh, just started to digitize all the material. But, you know, it, it was a really a, a discovery, you know, process, but it, but it was great. I mean, all of these hidden stories and, you know, they had some behind the scenes footage of themselves, which is incredibly rare because if you think about it, like, you know, back when they started in the eighties, like there were no cell phones. So, you know, there was, you know, hardly any footage of them. So anytime we found something like that, we were, we were really, really happy. 
Yeah, that's true. And so for people out there that um, don't know what we're talking about when it's like a life without a cell phone, <laughs> there was a period of time when we didn't have those and a lot of other things. So um, right. if you want to take a picture of somebody or let alone a video that you had to physically bring your camera yeah. or your camcorder. Camera. Yeah. Right. And then maybe ha hand it. Yeah. Hand it to somebody to actually take a picture of you. You couldn't do a selfie you know, of your own. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it a whole, whole different world for sure. And um when you were going through that footage, did that help? I can only assume it helped change the this year, like prior. Um, I lost a little bit of your question there. Sorry, we're having a thunderstorm oh, oh. here. But um, um, so I mean, yeah, I mean, it was incredible seeing some of these stories, and you know. Some stories, obviously, I knew about, um, you know, Somalia, um, you know, just Rwanda, all of these really hard stories that they covered. But to see their footage and it, it was pretty incredible. And then to talk to them about it, it really helped inform our interviews, you know, with these women. And, you know, they were really long interviews. I mean, if you talk to people who have worked, you know, in the field for almost 30 plus years, there's a lot of ground to cover. But um, it was really incredible. And they, they were really open. Like journalists are not the easiest people to, to interview. Um, it's hard to get them to open up. They don't always like talking about themselves. But, you know, this the footage, you know, gave us kind of like a direct line to say, hey, you know, tell me about this day. You know, what really happened? And it, it was really revelatory. That's, that's an interesting point because I, I know I found um, with some of the theater actors that I've interviewed that, they're fine playing a character, but when I have to talk to them, just being them, they get really uncomfortable. Um, and so I wish I had some footage of them doing something in their normal life that I could have said, yeah, can you tell me more about this thing from two years ago? Um, right. Cause then it becomes a conversation piece instead of me trying to, trying to figure things out from, from, <laughs> from nothing in some cases. Right. Um, but um, so as you were working through this film and got it together, uh, did it finish? in 2020 when you're getting ready like for the film festival circuit and had to wait for another year or kind of when did things kind of get ready where you can get it out to the public um i mean thankfully we were editing during covid um you know i felt bad for a lot of other filmmakers i know who were struggling and couldn't you know get out there or their film festival got shelled but we we finished it basically this past january and um you know started to submit to festivals um, you know, so the, the timing, you know, w was worked for us and, uh, our, you know, first festival was Tribeca, which was great. Yeah, they, no, that's, that's a, a grand stage to, to debut on. So yeah. it, it puts you in front of a lot of people for sure. Plus with that being, um, hybrid, you can also have you know, things in person, but then someone like me over in Seattle could still watch it too. Yeah, that was great. Um, you know, we were part of Tribeca at home and, you know, as far as I know, I think this is going to be a permanent fixture at Tribeca. And yeah, it was nice. I mean, a lot of people were really excited to be part of it. You know, obviously a lot of people can't travel, can't, a you know, get on a plane, but travel to New York. And yeah, it made the festival accessible to people. And I think that's that's something that a lot of festivals, you know, might be looking into in the future. Yeah, you're right. It sure sounds like almost all of them that I've covered so far, and I've covered five of them this year, that they plan on having some sort of virtual component next mm -hmm. year because it just it just makes sense yeah. um you can get it out to so many more people and then that helps broaden their platform and everything else and i know some of them are even doing like virtual reality um components when uh, you can interact with other i guess other people as you're watching it from home it just sounds really <laughs> sounds really interesting to me cool. yeah <laughs> yeah um and so with your with your own background um what got you into journalism in the first place? What made you want to do this? Um, I think it really started in college. I I was home one summer and watching the Tiananmen Square protests, um, you know, on CNN, which was still a new thing back then in '89, and I was really struck by the storytelling, the images that were coming out from there, and that really put me on a path to becoming a journalist, you know, knowing the importance of telling these stories about what's happening around the world, you know, really gave people insight, you know, into, you know, who has accessibility to democracy, who doesn't, you know, it really opened my eyes. And, um, 
20 years later, I would meet Cindy Strand, one of the characters in our film, who was there. She was like the last Western photojournalist the night of the Tiananmen Square massacre. And I met her and it's interesting. Like I never imagined it was a woman behind the camera. And it really, you know, kind of changed my perspective once I started to meet these, these camera women that they were just remarkable. And they had been doing this job, you know, for, for decades before, you know, I ever showed up. Okay. And um, for someone like me that has, I have nothing to relate to in terms of being in you know, war situations, conflict, um, how do you deal with that as a journalist and as a, as a human being? I mean, do you, do you come home with PTSD? Do you come home with other kind of things? Because I can't imagine being around that all the time that you must, some of it must affect you in that way, or am I wrong? Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard. I mean, sh you know, you, you're a journalist, you have a job to do, you, you know, you have to go and cover these stories, but moreover, you, you want to, right? Like all journalists are driven to, to do that, to tell the truth, to go to places, to show what's happening, you know, so we can share it with, with everyone else. And so there's like an importance and a drive to that work. But, you know, of course, we're also human beings. And, you know, I've been in situations where you just can't believe you're seeing what you're seeing. And it's, and it's really hard. Um, you know, I think when these women started out, you know, people didn't really talk about PTSD. It wasn't really recognized. And I think that they really relied on each other to kind of process some of the really, you know, horrific things that they saw. Um, you know, they covered wars and famines and massacres. And, you know, these, these things, they do take a toll on you as a human being. But, you know, I think for me, it, it, it helps just to talk to your friends and, you know, people that you work with and, and you try to sort of work through it. But, you know, I think there's always some things that stay with you and, and are very hard to forget. And I think most journalists would say that, you know, you go home and you put the faucet on and it's like, you know, you, you don't take the little things for granted anymore. I think when you've, when you've seen so many people without that. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, again, as I was watching this, I, I was like, I can't imagine what that's like, um, you know, as you're showing in your film, uh, when they're coming home and trying to readjust to being around friends or family and, um, and, and you even mentioned to me pre-show and like, sometimes you might come home. I just want to kind of decompress. I just want to kind of veg out for a bit. And then someone may already have something on an agenda for you to do. And it may not seem like that big of a deal to them, but to you, it's yeah. like, I need some time. Um, yeah, you do. I mean, it's not a normal life and, um, you know, you can get home really quickly, but your, your mind isn't home yet. You know, it's like, it's hard to act normal and people in your family are asked ask you a million questions and like, you know, you just, it's hard to just kind of, you need a little time just to decompress and, and, you know, you don't tell everybody everything because they don't need to know, but, um, you know, I think time helps and, and just kind of talking to your colleagues, but you know, there's just some things are just are unbelievable. You know, they're hard to forget. Yeah. I, I, I can only imagine. Um, um, Part of my my day job at one point i was working with um, gang involved youth in south seattle and i had done that for 10 years and um had a few um students that are no longer with us um, through gang activity that got shot and killed and just on that level for me it's something yeah i just, like I, I still remember the the news when i heard it i remember where i was i remember all these aspects so when you're doing something on the level of what these ladies are doing and yourself um for multiple times through, throughout the years i'm like gosh, that's a lot to be carrying with you at some point. But like you said, you're talking with people and kind of getting that out of your system at times. And it's kind of annoying. It, it kind of comes with the territory. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the film's title. It's No Ordinary Life. It's not something yeah. that's not, you know, eight to five job and you come home on a Monday through Friday kind of a thing. It's like, no, you're, you're doing things. But if you love it and you're passionate about it, then that's what drives you. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so Heather, with the things that you've been um, covering yourself over the years. Uh, what are we looking at now? Is there something else you've been working on? Some other projects you have coming up that are, are maybe already out or coming out soon? Um, I'm just developing a couple projects right now. Um, I had a couple freelance gigs on a documentary series about waste. Um, and uh, just trying to, you know, think about some other stories to pitch. Um, you know, there's a lot of 
a lot happening in the political space right now. I live in Atlanta. So, uh, you know, voter suppression and voting rights is a huge issue here right now. So that's something that we're looking into. So we're just kind of in, in development mode and try to uh, enjoy a little bit of summer while we're while we can. <laughs> <laughs> OK. And as you were uh, making this particular film, um, at least with the film people that I've talked to, they've always said that there is something about their film that, and they may have been like, I don't know, six months after they're done with it, that they're like, I think I should have changed that or I should have fixed this. Or we had an extended scene there that I think we should have put in. Have you looked at this film yourself and thought, yeah, there's something I would like to change. It's kind of the, you know, the, the cross that almost every artistic person bears, but I'm just curious. I mean, sure. There's, I mean, they had so many great stories, all these camera women and to have five characters in a film is, is tricky. Like, you know, I've, I've made a lot of documentaries over my career, but to have five characters was an interesting, you know, balance and weaving process to kind of keep their stories going. I mean, we left a lot on the floor and, and it was hard, but um, it, it, you know, it's a tough film to watch as, as you've said. And, and I really tried to keep the audience in mind of, you know, taking them on this journey. I wanted, you know, them to understand like the point of view of these, these female photographers, you know, like being in that moment, being immersed in, in what is happening with them, you know, throughout all of these stories. And yeah, I mean, there were, there were a lot we left on the floor. Um, you know, they did a lot of work in Saudi Arabia during the full, first Gulf war. And, you know, it was interesting for them because a bunch of them were together. And if you know, Saudi women, you know, are beginning to drive, but back then, like, you couldn't drive. You can't pay for a hotel room. You can't book a hotel room. You know, you have to put your male producer in, in front of, you know, to get anything done in Saudi. And, and, you know, in the interviews, they were all kind of, you know, understood the culture, but yet they were also bitching about it because they couldn't just do their job. And these, these are women who are like, they don't take no for an answer. You know, they do everything themselves. They're like really, really tough. And, you know, for them to kind of have to take a backseat in Saudi, you know, I think really just pissed them off. So, you know, that was one thing I kind of left on the floor. Um, you know, the stories were great, but I kind of feel like with a documentary, they have their own natural lifespan. And, you know, when we finally put it together, it felt like the right length and, you know, the right sort of stories to drive people's interest. So, I didn't want to, you know, make it too long that people wouldn't wouldn't stick around, you know. That that makes perfect sense. It's kind of like you, you want to make your point uh, with your film, or like if if you're writing a song, that kind of thing. You don't want to just put it, something in there just to make it, you know, sort of a four minute song. Now you have a six minute song. It's kind of like, well, no, I've I've said what I need to say here, so let's kind of like end on a high note and kind of <laughs> get out on that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. And with, with your um, with all the documentary and all the works that you've done. Um, did you go for uh, for schooling for that then, or is that all, at the same time when you were studying journalism, or how did, did they, how did things come together, or were there always separate lanes for you? Um, I have a degree in communications and journalism, so that was kind of the track. Um, you know, I always know I, I knew I wanted to go on. Um, you know, documentaries. I kind of like grew up watching National Geographic and you know early Discovery Channel, and just always loved documentaries. Like what what better way to learn about the world than to, to go there. And I always thought there was such value, you know, in documentary filmmaking that, you know, I always knew I wanted to tell stories like visually and, um, you know, by force and chance and luck, you know, here I am. Okay. And so what was your, your first documentary experience like that you made? Oh God, I think it was terrible. Um, I was like a student and um, it was about pet therapy. It was, it was a train wreck. It was really bad. I think I got like a C or something in college. And then I realized like, okay, I had to up my game. This is like with a high eight camera. It was like a student film. Yeah, it was really bad. My t professor was like, this is just terrible, you know? <laughs> so I started to learn and, and watch documentaries and, um, you know, educate myself a bit more. But yeah, that's pretty funny. I haven't thought about that in a while. <laughs> it was a mess. <laughs> Well, you know, everyone starts somewhere, as I always say. <laughs> right, yeah. Anybody, I mean, I had, I had this virtual environment. I had not done this kind of thing until last year in May. And so 
the first uh, interview I ever did is it's on my YouTube channel and I look back and I go oh my gosh I, mean, it was like, <laughs> right. I was nervous yeah, yeah. My, yeah. My, my voice was up here it's like what happened to my voice and uh, I'm, I'm trying to be like some sort of like TV show host which was terrible because that wasn't me at all right um, yeah. so yeah you, you, you kind of find your way as you do things um, and uh, is there um, have you ever Maybe you have an interest or don't have an interest, but have you ever looked at doing a feature that is fictional, that has nothing to do with documentaries? Yeah, I have actually. Um, I have a story in mind, and you know, as a documentary filmmaker, you, you know, I have a lot of friends who who have made narratives as well. But to me, it's still this like mysterious world of like grips and um you know catering trucks and you know there's so much filming going on in atlanta it's like these huge deals so you know it's a little daunting like editorially i know i probably have a good story but it's like crossing over that canyon from you know documentary crews you know are you know fairly lean you know maybe we had two dps and you know a great editor and composer but it's like you know our footprint is relatively small because you know, documentaries often by nature are, you know, more personal or, you know, having a large team can kind of intimidate people to open up, you know, but I look at like, you know, the difference between, you know, narrative and, and documentary, it's, you know, they almost seem like two different worlds, but yeah, I, I have, you know, an idea that's kind of percolating around. So, so we'll see. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've had a chance to talk to some other filmmakers and sometimes if they're doing nothing but narratives i also the other question have you thought about doing a documentary it's like yeah actually i am working on this idea so yeah i kind of think it kind of seems like if you're trying to tell a story period then you'll just kind of find the best format for it yeah yeah that's a good way to put it okay um and so i have i have kind of a curious mind so sometimes these questions just kind of pop off of wherever the my curious mind takes me um <laughs> so as a filmmaker slash journalist um were you also, have you been living in other parts of the world like the, what these ladies were doing for like weeks and months at a time, then coming back home, that whole, was your lifestyle pretty much similar to what they were doing? Um, similar, not not as long. I mean, I would be gone for max, you know, three weeks, maybe a month occasionally, um, you know, working on a project and, and then kind of come back home. But I think as a producer, you know, you do that a little bit less. Um, you know, photographers are constantly on the road. Um, my husband's a photographer and he's gone. So, um, you know, I think it's to the life that they led was, was really very demanding. And, and that's something that I wanted to show in the film. It's like a lot of people always ask like, Oh, well, you know, what was their home life like? And I'm like, they didn't go home. They would go home to like do laundry and repack and then like go back on the road for three months. Um, you know, when they started, um, you know, a lot of, you know, CNN and a lot of the other networks, they would cover a story for months at a time. You know, they were in Sarajevo during the war for, you know, months, sometimes more Somalia for a long time. You know, they would really cover the story. I mean, they would basically set up like a little village and, you know, which is hard to do in, in a lot of these places, let alone a war zone, just the logistics alone of setting up you know, uh, a base camp, you know, in, in Mogadishu, Somalia is, is tough, but, um, you know, I think, I think you kind of learn, you have your road family and you're there for each other. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it's funny. One of the characters said, you know, it's not an ordinary life. And that's when I realized, okay, I think that's a good title for the film. I mean, it's just, that's as simple as it is. It's just a very, you know, different life. Um, but, you know, they, they chose it. I mean, I chose it, um, you know, no regrets. Um, you you get a front row seat to history, um, which is absolutely incredible. You meet amazing people. Um, you know, I've been to so many different countries and, you know, Greenland, and you see things up close that, you know, other people only see, you know, from your video. So, you know, it's, it's like an honor to cover these stories, despite some of the sacrifices. Okay, well, that's, that's wonderful. And, um, um, as we kind of wrap things up here, for people that are watching this right now, uh, the film is called No Ordinary Life, and we're here with director Heather O'Neill. Um, Heather, have you been, what's, what's been one of the most perhaps harrowing situations you personally have been in on an assignment? Um, well, probably 2007, I was covering the um, Israel-Hezbollah war 
So um, we were in Israel and up by the border of Lebanon and we were driving back. I was with my then boyfriend, now husband and our sound tech. And um, there were these Katusha rockets that were being fired um, right up near that northern area of Israel and Lebanon. And, you know, we were driving back to Jerusalem and, you know, 60, 70 yards in front of our car, this like tree blew up and, you know, it's just a little too close for us. We pulled over and just sort of got our shit together and put our helmets back on and chilled out for a minute and then just really drove fast. So, you know, I mean, like being in close proximity to that, you know, is, is never fun, but, um, you know, that's probably the closest I've been to, you know, getting blown up. So, but, you know, we didn't, so thank God. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, when you're telling that story, I'm just like, I can't even get my head wrapped around having something blow up that close to me. Um, it's like an outer body experience. I don't know how to describe it. So, you know, sometimes it, you know, you're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But, you know, I mean, you know, as journalists, I think over the decades, um, you know, organizations have, you know, there's training now, if you're going into a hostile environment, you have flak jackets, you have helmets, you know, you, you know what to do um, most of the time, you know, so you have sort of that training and experience and, you know, just have your head on a swivel. And it's all about knowing what's going on around you. But, um, you know, it, it, there's, it's still dangerous. It's a definitely dangerous profession. I mean, journalists are killed every year, you know, around the world. So it's tough. Right. Right. And um, as we do wrap this up, um, where can people see No Ordinary Life? Is it going to be on digital platforms? Is it already on digital platforms? What's kind of where can they access this film? Yeah, well, we're hoping soon. Um, we are working on distribution and um, just found a great sales agent that we're going to work with. Um, so, you know, that's kind of our next step. We're still going through our festival run. So we're still kind of in the early stages of rolling it out, but, um, you know, we're hopeful. We've gotten a lot of interest in the film. So, um, you know, we'll keep you posted on, on where we end up. Sounds good. This is a film that people need to see. So I hope it gets a, a wide audience for it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we hope so too. Awesome. Well, Heather, thank you so much for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. And I wish you every success with the film and all and every aspect of your career that you have. And I hope that you and uh, your husband stay safe down there. And um, yeah, hopefully get a chance perhaps in the future to talk again about a uh, future project that you have. Great. All right. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good day. All right. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.